Secretary Ross, thanks so much for being with us here in Brussels. You've announced to Congress, your department, that you're going to be pursuing trade agreements with the UK, Europe and Japan. As someone here covering Brexit, I have to ask you, is the timing intentionally political or is it just a coincidence that a couple of hours from now European leaders are going to be meeting to discuss a Brexit proposal that would actually limit the UK's ability to pursue free trade agreements in the near future? Well, it's a combination of things. We've had some exploratory discussions with all three parties already. UK, as you know, can't do a formal discussion until post-Brexit, so March 29th of next year. But uh, the other two, there's no reason they can't. And in fact, I met with Cecilia Malmstrom, the commissioner, uh, yesterday. I wanted to ask you, uh, USMCA recently announced contained a, essentially a break clause in there. I think you yourself called it a poison pill. That means that if participants in that trilateral agreement decide to pursue a trade agreement with a non-market country, as it's termed, probably a reference to China, one could imagine, that the other two parties in that trilateral agreement are able subsequently to pull out. Is that the kind of proviso that you would insist on in a trade agreement with, let's say, the EU or Japan? And do you think those entities would accept that kind of restriction? Well, the reason we put it in is there's been a lot of dilution of the benefits to the U.S. from the existing free trade agreement with Mexico and Canada as a result of their making free trade agreements elsewhere. But uh, the real intention is to make sure that they don't just do one with a non-market economy without a consultation period, without some accord, and with us having the right to withdraw, just as they would have the right to withdraw if we did it. Soon after you announced that Section 232 investigation into auto imports, the EU responded saying it lacked, quote, legitimacy, factual basis and violates international trade rules. You've not said when that investigation will wrap up. You've obviously got a few months till you need to send your findings to the president. But would that investigation's results in any way be contingent on how trade talks progress with the EU, with Japan? Well, the president announced earlier on that he would not do any new 232 tariff impositions on the EU as long as talks were going in a reasonably good manner. So that admonition still holds place. Well, Secretary Ross, at that point, I'd like to hand you over to my US colleagues who I think have some more questions for you. Oh, fine. Thank you, Willem. Uh, Secretary Ross, it's David Faber. I'd love to just change the conversation for a second to China. You know your way as well as anybody around deals, and you know it's a focus of mine. Um, there is a concern that the antitrust authorities in China are going to use their ability to not approve deals uh, as another sort of weapon in this ongoing war between our countries, specific to approval of United Technologies' acquisition of Rockwell Collins, or even Disney's acquisition of those Fox assets. Do you have a sense for whether that's a possibility or a view on, on, um, on how those deals are going to uh, fare with the Chinese regulators as they await approval? Well, I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on acquisitions that are pending before another country's regulatory authorities. I, I was surprised when the Chinese uh, vetoed the Qualcomm acquisition of NXP, because that had been approved by quite a few other countries, and China was the only one who turned it down. Now, the Chinese say that was not related to trade disputes, but um, you never know. All I know is everybody else approved it, and they turned it down. And specific to China overall and where things stand in terms of the possibility of continued negotiations, I'm seeing something uh, on the wires just now from uh, Larry Kudlow, the economic advisor, saying China hasn't responded yet to U.S. requests over trade and talks. Is that your understanding as well? Is there a continued impasse between the two countries about future talks? I don't know that I'd call it a continued impasse. Um, we are where we are, and in any negotiation, there are ups and downs, there are hiatuses, and there are much more active periods. 
So it appears as though we may be in something of a hiatus now. Uh, when does that, it's Carl, by the way, Mr. Secretary, when does that change? Uh, when does the pace of negotiation speed up again? Uh, I assume you think this will we'll have to wait to get through the midterms. I mean, is, uh, is G20 going to be the next uh, possible meeting of any, of any uh, significance or scope? Well, meetings of world leaders at the G20 never get into huge amounts of detail. Those are meetings that are designed to be broad policy statements. And then there are the little pull asides at the perimeters of the big session. And sometimes there's a bit of discussion there. But generally, those are an hour or less in duration. And you can't do a multi-thousand page trade agreement in an hour. Secretary Ross, this is Morgan Brennan. I just I want to shift gears again and ask you uh, about another piece of news that's been coming out today. There's this $15 billion contract that's being competed over by General Electric and Siemens in terms of power generation in Iraq. Uh, an FT report this morning um, suggesting that GE might end up with that deal specifically because of intense pressure from the Trump administration for it to potentially go that way. Is, is that something that is actually playing out right now in Iraq or in other countries in terms of some of the deals that U.S. companies are bidding for? Well, whenever there's a large transaction that involves competitors in a couple of different countries, the sponsoring nations normally do what we call advocacy. And so that's nothing very surprising uh, to hear. Um, Mr. Secretary, changing gears one more time before we send it back to Willem for a couple of uh, concluding questions. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia, something you also know well, um, how important are arms sales to that country, given they seem to be wrapped up in what our current talks with them about the apparent murder of, uh, of Mr. Khashoggi? Well, um I'm not going to get out ahead of the rest of the U.S. government on the Saudi topic. Uh, they are a substantial purchaser of arms. As you know, the president did send Secretary Pompeo over there to learn more about it. Let's just see how it plays out. Willem, we'll send it back over to you now. So, Graham, I've got a follow-up on that. You talk about them being a substantial portion of U.S. arms uh, production. Uh, there are about 20% of U.S. arms exports, but that's a relatively small fraction of U.S. defense industry production since so much of that is sold domestically. I think my question is really, is it fair to say that the sustaining of defense industry jobs in the U.S. is more of a priority for this administration than the promotion and protection of human rights overseas? I don't think that's reasonable to say. You saw the lengths to which the president went to get the three hostages back from North Korea. You see the lengths to which he went to get the pastor back. Those are big achievements. And in contrast to the prior administration, we didn't pay any ransom. It was done strictly by negotiation, but we accomplished the mission. A lot of people have mocked President Obama for setting red lines when it came to Syria. You've got Saudi Arabia being responsible for, largely responsible for a blockade in Yemen that's left millions of people starving, could lead to what the UN warns is the worst famine in a century. That's been with US military support. The State Department's recently recertified their bombing runs that they've acknowledged have killed dozens of civilians, including children. They're now accused of the murder of a Washington Post columnist in a NATO allied country. What are the red lines for the Trump administration that would change the calculus on that relationship with Riyadh? Well, as to the unfortunate apparent demise of the Washington Post reporter, that's a matter that's under investigation. So we, ha we can't prejudge what the outcome of that will be. But the president's not so much in the habit of drawing red lines as he is of just taking action when the situation warrants it. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to hand it back to you guys in the U.S. now.